course, on criminology back in 2009. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for your kind invitation. Thank you very much for the honor of being here with you at the panel. I guess the assessments about the impact of political powers might have on the effectiveness or efficacy of the principle of universal jurisdiction, as the chairperson said, and the wonderful summary of the real situation, well, it means that I don't need to add any specific comments. But all these hindrances, which can be easily verified, political and historical reality might might be understood as a way for skepticism in uh, universal jurisdiction and somehow devoid of all legitimacy. And we need to find our vaccine against it. Historically speaking, the universal jurisdiction principle started over 200 years ago, and then it finds its way into the customer, international customary law. And how does it become legitimate or, or lawful these days? I think nowadays legitimacy of this principle comes from the first article of the Universal Declaration on Human Rights. The condition uh, as, of all humans as people. We are all people. Our colleague, Professor from Salamanca, Ms. Cepeda, explained that we needed to have penalty powers on those culprit for genocide. Anna is younger than me, and she still believes in prevention in general terms. I do not believe in prevention, but for some exceptions. I think uh, genocide needs to be prevented in a different way. I don't think that penalty fines or punishments, punishments as they are, and that the enforcement of universal jurisdiction will help us efficiently prevent genocide from happening. We need to be very careful because otherwise we would be in a comfortable situation thinking that we've been preventing, but we have not, if we do it like that. First remark, what do we want for universal jurisdiction? We want to have penalty powers on those culprit for genocide. But we're talking about a political powers as well. Political powers at a national level is highly selective. Go to any prison in the, in the world and you see that the most vulnerable, the least favored, the less, least skilled are the ones that are in prison. Only a few exceptions. What about a VIP? Well, if there's a VIP, it's because they got into a struggle with another VIP, and so he's been withdrawn for, from society. If we talk about international level, it's just the same. It's once again selective because of the transnationalization. It doesn't change. But again, that penalty powers that that punishing powers is still selective at a national level and international level. So, how do we get it to be legitimate, to be lawful? Well, starts with the first article of the Universal Declaration. All kinds of laws, of legal systems uh, that give way to genocide starts with a clear differentiation. There is a group of people who think of themselves as people and who think of another group as non-people. So, they punish 
those that commit a crime within the group of people, but those outside the group don't get a penalty because they are enemies. And traitors inside the group, they don't get penalties anyway. They are destroyed, they are deleted, because they are entities instead of people. This is the essence of all inhuman law. Compared to this inhuman law, there is a project for a human law based on the first art article number one and the declaration. And I say this is a project, not a reality. A project, it's to be developed over time and in space as well. And human rights, there's still a project, there's still an agenda. It's a project whose uh, enf which enforcement elements need to be put forward and pushed forward by all of us, but it's still a project. If it, they were a reality, uh, and resigned in all declarations and constitutions and everything, well, it would be different, but now we, keep to p we need to keep pushing them forward so that they are enforced. What about genocide? Well, culprits of genocide because of the scope of the unlawful act finds itself outside this definition of person. When they lose power, they become highly vulnerable. As long as they are in power, they are okay. But when they're out of power, that's when there is a choice for punitive power, for punishment. But after that, they become vulnerable. It is an individual that if not taken away by the state and, uh, and say, I will punish you as a person, anyone could destroy them as an entity. And that's where human law fails. This oblivion, this, this way not to punish the culprit for genocide means that they are not a person anymore. So if the culprit was executed, then some people find themselves silenced and they realize that they can have no punitive power because there are different excuses. Let me give you two examples. Iran, when they ex executed Talat in Berlin in 1993, if I'm not mistaken, he was subject to a court in Weimar Republic, a Democratic Republic, and they ruled them crazy, so he could not be indicted. But he was saying he just died old in the U.S. without uh, being uh, remanded to a psychiatric ward or anything like that. And then uh, during the Nuremberg uh, trials and Mussolini's execution, ex Mussolini's executor with his lover and everyone else, years go by. And then what happens at Como's uh, court? They cannot go on, they cannot convict anyone, and they fell it away saying it was a war act because the Salon Republic had not entered into the treaty. It was a puppet state, actually, and people were fleeing to Switzerland. It was a lynch, it was an, uh, an executioner. Yes, it was a group, but uh, it was not looked into because they said this was not an act of war. It is just an excuse. So I failed. What can I do not to have them convicted? Because I failed. Because they are not considered a person, they don't have a person status, so what can I do to find my way out? Well, I think this is the foundation. So human law needs, needs to impose penalties and not an annihilation of the perpetrator, of the culprit for genocide. These outcomes sometimes well, they, they have an impact that uh, promote universal citizenship that tries to operate on the basis of the article number one on the Declaration of Human Rights. Human beings, as beings, we're 
weird. We've needed a few thousand years of Judaism and Hinduism and Christendom to come together and say, we all human beings, we're all person, we are all people, as to recognize ourselves as part of the species, member of the species, and that we are all entitled to our rights. I think all other animal species can do without it. They don't need it. But we did need it. And so, we try to set a human legal system where we are all acknowledged, uh, where we all get our status as person acknowledged. In Argentina, well, this is just one of the many experiences that you can find, of the many experiences that could be shared. Well, the Argentinian case was quite curious. We all know the ups and downs in the Convention for the crimes against humanity committed during the last military dictatorship, mainly. After a series of uh, events and accidents, some pardon laws and amnesty laws of issues, whatever they are called, which were approved by a group elected by the people, the country. But all of a sudden, at the Congress, at the House of Commons, what well, they decide to override those amnesty or pardon laws. So thinking that a Congress or a House of Commons might, ha might, might have the jurisdiction over these rules, the skills to override them, well, they could go and appeal to natural law and which may be difficult and might be a hindrance for punitive power. We, need, we know that the limitations of punitive power need to be preserved at all costs. A genocide is just a punitive power that has gone out of scope and which has become unlimited if there is a state that becomes in, an inhuman, unhuman and surpasses all the limitations and all the safeguards of that punitive power, when invoked, the penalty exceeds the genocide. So when punishing a culprit for genocide, we should never, ever go beyond the limitations that are set out in the punitive power itself to penalize him for or her for the crimes committed. There are some clear principles enshrined in international law and all constitutions. We also see retroactivity. And so we need to be careful with all this. Given authorization to a House of Commons or, or a Congress for this kind of uh, overriding or annulment was unheard of. We are not the British Parliament when back in the 16th century they said that they were almighty and they could do anything except for uh, turning a man into a woman, having a, a woman who is uh, a judge, or having Malta in Europe. These all three things are possible now, so, well, things have changed, but our Congress has limitations, it's not the same. And that's when we turn to universal jurisdiction. First, the request for extradition, extradition in, in Spain. The principle of universal jurisdiction was not an, a, a, an option, it was a reality now. We found ourselves at a crossroads, which was either to break international law and become a resort for international criminals or play or abide by international law and have our people prosecuted by Spanish jurisdiction. Then, other option was to dismantle 
the foundation of international jurisdiction and so have them judged or prosecuted in Argentina according to Argentina's constitution. A constitution, no matter what its layout is, is a system which is difficult to be reformed but tries to set out the basis for the enforcement of government, uh, which is now known as sovereignty. As a result of the enforcement of sovereignty, it is uh, jurisdiction, so exercising their powers over their citizens. In any situation, you cannot understand a constitution as an instrument for governance where, where you need the help of a foreign jurisdiction. And it was the universal jurisdiction principle that, that, that made it clear that you do not have the jurisdiction to override a law, but it is much better if all three state powers simultaneously decide to have them prosecuted according to our jurisdiction, our case law. So, According to universal jurisdiction, when someone is uh, is claiming a, a criminal, is either because they don't want to prosecute this person or because they cannot prosecute the culprit. So if there is such a thing as an international community, it finds itself in a given situation, capitalist diminutive situation, which potentially effect, eventually affects all inhabitants. So if I'm part of a country where this principle is in play because they cannot or will not prosecute its own criminals responsible for crimes against humanity, that means that I also under suspicion when I wear my passport with me to travel around the world. So potentially all citizens, all people find themselves in this uh, situation of capital diminutio. This was a way to preclude all the elements used to explain crimes along the border in Germany with the, the fall of the war. They use natural law, they use different formula and resources which are very difficult, very, very, very troublesome for individual due dil diligence and safeguards. But open way to prosecutors, well, prosecutions for crimes against humanity and by barely playing by the safeguards of criminal law. And by the way, using our own ordinary courts, criminal law, and procedural law. It's been hard work. It's been selective as well. Uh, we've had a few pitfalls and hindrances, and I would like to publicly thank the Spanish legal system, especially Justice Bar Garzón, for their enforcement of the principle of uh, universal jurisdiction, which in our situation we found very useful. Again, and insist, you find all the difficulties and all the selectiveness that we mention, but its effectiveness does not come from its preemptive power, it does not come from its being selective, which, is, which it is, but it comes from such a foundation, such pillar, and that it's the willingness to have this human legal system according to Article Number 1 in the Declaration of Human Rights. Thank you very much. As a high representative of uh, the, the uh, judiciary in, in Argentina, how is the criminal hacerlo? law understood and Esto are no they independent? No in the uh, this is, is not, not a question from Baltasar, <laughs> I can say. I fully agree with what the colleague said, so I will not dwell on that. As for your uh, Spanish justice and um, Justice Garzón, 
I think, and, and well, I don't think it is important. I, I, I'm not saying whether Garthon's decision to tap telephones was right or not. If it is not right, then you repeal it. If it is correct, you confirm it. And there's something, and I have to apologize uh, before you, Spanish people. I think there is a layout, there is a structure of this system. And we need to see whether it is dependent or not um, on the other powers. So actually, I think it breaks the judicial independence. There are many Spanish colleagues, uh, they don't notice it because they are used to it. But, well, we all have a different mindset because we all have different roles. We are not coming out of an incubator. And our Spanish colleagues uh, are working on institu institutionalized system, but think about it, it's a, it's a problem. Judicial independence needs to be external and internal. External, it belongs, uh, it means it is uh, non-dependent on the executive power or economic powers, but when it's broken, it isn't a scandal. And it's only exceptionally broken, not in all cases. As for internal independence, that's what the judge needs to be independent from all other bar barristers and lawyers and higher entities. Without that independence, the judge becomes a handwriter for higher commands, and it would be a top-down system. There cannot be internal independence if a judge can be punished, taken away, withdrawn, or prosecuted and convicted by a higher entity. So how could then a judge be in disaccordance with a different body's decision? That would not be internal independent independence. That's the problem I identify. Well, if there was some problem, then you have your decisions repealed, that's all. But what cannot be is that higher courts, higher levels, have other people's taken away, prosecuted, and convicted, let alone because of unfair sentences. I don't know how many fair or unfair sentences I've, I've issued in my life. Maybe all of them were fair, maybe all of them were unfair, I doubt, I doubt it. But let's forget about how Spanish law criminalizes crimes, but focusing on independence of the judiciary, think about it, think how institutionalized it is, because this is a problem that is in violation with the internal independence. I think over 35 years that I've been working as a judge, if I, if I had been subdued to this kind of institutionalization right now, I would be serving life sentence because of all these crimes.